Welcome to lecture number 12 in multiple antenna communications at Linköping University. This is the last lecture in this lecture series and therefore I will put the context of this course into some perspective. So I will talk about the evolution of cellular networks in particular three ways of making improvements and then the role of multiple antennas in those different ways. Then I will give you a brief summary of the main benefits of multiple antenna communications that I've been talking about previously in this course. And I will wrap up with a short outlook towards the future, what will happen with the multiple antenna technology in the future, as far as we can predict it right now. Martin Cooper was one of the inventors of the handheld mobile phone. He was working at Motorola in the US and he was noting in the 90s that the number of data connections had doubled every 2.5 years. And that has become known as the Martin Cooper's law. And it actually has been going on since the beginning of wireless. So from the beginning it was about voice connections of different kinds, but now we can more talk about data connections. And the doubling every 2.5 years is represented by an annual growth of 32%, which is quite a large number. So that also means that even if we're building a network that fits for today, in a few years time we will need a more advanced network that can deal with more data. And the cellular network technology is the main concept for being able to deliver wireless services over a large area. Because we have this limited resources, limited amount of bandwidth for example, and how can we be able to still serve a huge number of users? Well, we need to divide the world into different areas, and we call them cells, where we have base stations that are serving the users that are in a particular area. And this concept was proposed already in the 1950s in the US where they had the ideas about how should we be able to have some kind of wireless communication services. And then the first real deployments of mobile communications was in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And then we have seen different evolutions of this technology, a new generation every 10 years in terms of mobile telephony, but we have also seen evolutions in between there. So often those improvements within one generation can be very substantial as well. Let's look at the current trends when it comes to mobile data traffic in the cellular networks. So the source here is the Ericsson Mobility Report from November 2019. And they are then providing a estimate of how much data is transmitted in the world in 2019. It's around 40 exabyte per month. And then it's predicted to increase over the years in this manner here. And we can see that the yellow part here is what is delivered by 4G, 3G and 2G. And that one is flattening it out to some extent. But then the new 5G technology that was started to be deployed in 2019 will take over and be the main contributor to the growth here. And what we can see is that we will go from 40 up to 160 in one, two, three, four, five, six year. According to the Cooper's law, we would have done it in five years. So now we have a slightly a weaker growth rate, but it's still 26%. So we still have a very rapid growth in the mobile data traffic. And the 4G networks that we have today wouldn't be able to deliver all of this growth. So that's why we need a new technology such as 5G to take care of that. So just to break down this number, because an exabyte is something that is very hard to comprehend, if we take that number, we divide with the around 8 billion people that we have in the world, then in 2019, we have around 5 gigabyte per month per person on the average over the world. And then we can expect that there are some parts of the world where we have two times this or even more, while there are other people in the world that still lacks a basic connectivity. But this is on the average, and that will then grow up to 20 gigabyte per month per person in the world on the average in 2025. So how can we create better cellular networks? Well, a simple way of looking at that is to consider a particular area. This can be a city, for example. And then we can ask the question, what is the network throughput in bits per second per square kilometer in this area? And that can be captured using a simple formula, saying that the throughput in bits per second per square kilometer is divided up into three factors. 
the cell density, which is the number of cells per square kilometer that we put into this area. Then we have the available frequency spectrum, measured in hertz, and then we have the spectral efficiency in bits per second per hertz per cell. So this is explained by the technology, this is explained by the frequencies that we are using, and this is uh, in terms of the infrastructure, the density of that one. And suppose that we would like to build a technology that can deliver a 100 times improvement here, well then we need to sort of increase the throughput by 100 times and we have different factors to play with. We can achieve that by having a 100 times higher cell density or a 100 times more spectrum or 100 times more spectral efficiency, but it's usually much more efficient to have all of these three factors playing a role. So maybe we would take five times higher cell density, two times higher spectrum, and 10 times more spectral efficiency. That will multiply up to 100 times. There are many different ways that one can achieve a 100 times higher improvement if that is what we are looking for, but we can be quite sure that in any such scenario, it's all of these three factors that we need to improve. So let's look more closely onto them. When it comes to the cell density, this is actually a traditional way of improving the throughput of cell networks. So we have gone from having many kilometers between the different base station towers to have just a few hundred meters in urban areas. The issue with increasing the cell density is that if we cut the cell radius by a factor set, then we need set square more cells because we are sort of deploying them over a two dimension area. So if we go from one case with this size of the cells, then when we are reducing the cell size, we see that quickly we need more and more cells and it grows in a quadratic manner. And the issue with this is really that it's associated with very high deployment and renting costs. So this is the major expense today in terms of having a cellular network to rent the space to put up your base station towers. And the technology has become cheaper and cheaper, but the renting costs and deployment costs are still not something that is reducing over time, but rather increasing. And it's also that as we are densifying networks, you have more cells that are in your vicinity, and that can lead to more interference, in particular because the propagation conditions also changes when you have smaller areas so that interference from neighboring cells becomes more important. And most uses are all of a sudden at the edges of the cells here where you have more interference from the neighboring cells. So I would say that higher cell density is something that we definitely will see in certain areas, in particular indoors, for example, but we still have something that's very dense. We have Wi-Fi deployed in many countries, almost everywhere inside buildings, and we have cellular coverage in the urban areas to a large extent. It is the coverage that is the main issue to reach everywhere. And just densifying and densifying won't really be able to find all of the spots where we have bad performance today. We will definitely see a larger cell density in the future, but it might not be the leading force in terms of increasing the network throughput anymore. When it comes to the spectrum ranges, we have limited amount of spectrum that we need to divide between the different cells and users. And if we are looking at the spectrum ranges here, we have FM radio starting at around 100 megahertz. Then we have an area between 300 megahertz up to 5 gigahertz. This is where most of the wireless uh, services today are being located. So 2G, 3G, 4G and Wi-Fi, they are typically put into this area here. And within this interval here, which is less than 5 gigahertz wide, we actually in Sweden, for example, have already one gigahertz allocated for wireless communications. And then there are other services that also require this type of spectrum. So it is hard to identify new spectrum in these ranges, even if we can still do that. And that is something that's also happening. But the important thing is that it is within this spectrum range where it's suitable for coverage. So if you would like to reach many locations, then we would like to have as low frequency as possible in order to propagate better through walls and so on. But when people are looking for new wide range of spectrum, you need to look further up in the frequency range. So in particular, people are talking about the millimeter wave spectrum. So there are some bands that are being used now in 5G uh, that are in 28 and 39 gigahertz. And then there are other empty areas further up in the frequency range where we might use uh, wireless communication in the future. 
And just to as a reference, further up here we have the visible light, and there are also technologies for wireless communications that is using visible light. But in 5G is particularly this range that is considered. So it includes the traditional frequencies up to say 80 gigahertz. So more millimeter wave spectrum are being added. But the problem with going up in frequency is the higher propagation losses. So for example, if you just put your hand over your eyes, you don't see visible light. And the similar type of effects are happening more and more at millimeter wave frequencies that the signals are not propagating through basic obstacles like a human body or a wall and so. So for that reason, those type of higher frequencies are mainly useful for short range hotspots uh, in a room, for example, while we still need to evolve the technology at the lower frequency to be able to still deliver good coverage on networks. So the early deployments of 5G are considering, say, the 2.5, 3.5 gigahertz range as the main spectrum ranges, and then adding specific ranges in the millimeter wave spectrum as some add-on in certain regions. And the important thing here is that multiple antenna communications, or MIMO, plays a important role in all of these different frequency ranges, but it is different in different ranges. So at lower frequencies, we can particularly help with the coverage. We can uh, spatially multiplex many users, while at millimeter wave frequencies, you might not have so many users in a small area, but we can still utilize multiple antennas to achieve beamforming gains. And in some cases, you can have multiplexing gains for a point-to-point -point link, for example. So. MIMO technology will be fundamental in all of the different frequencies, but different flavors of it will be useful at different places. Finally, when it comes to the higher spectral efficiency, if you just look at the point-to-point -point link from one antenna to one antenna, then we know that the capacity limit is sort of described by log 2 or 1 plus the received signal power divided by the interference power plus the noise power. So this is measured in bits per second per hertz. And if we would like to increase this number, well, one basic thing is to increase the signal power. But if we increase the power here, then the spectral efficiency is barely going to be increased, even if we have a linear scale here of the power, because of this logarithm. So for example, if we have a 4 bits per second per hertz in our setup, and we would like to get 8 bits per second per hertz, we need to use 17 times more power in our own transmission. And if we increase the signal power here by 17 times, there is a big risk that the people who are interfering with us would also ramp up their power and then it's the zero sum game. So this is in particularly also where multiple antennas becomes important to increase the spectral efficiency. And increasing spectral efficiency in a fundamental manner is something that haven't been done in previous evolutions of cellular networks. But now when multiple antenna technology is more readily available, I believe that higher spectral efficiency will be one of the main driving forces in terms of increasing the network throughput in future networks. So how does multiple antennas help? Well, traditionally, it has been used to achieve fixed beam falling. So the typical base station antennas that you can see on rooftops and in towers are these vertical panels. They are creating a fixed beam uh, focused right in front of the array. So you have a certain area, say 120 degrees, that you're supposed to cover with your uh, antenna. And then you are focusing the signal down towards the ground where the users are. And this is a so-called 16 dBi antenna, uh, which means that if you're standing right in front of it, you are one of these lucky users, you get 16 decibels stronger signal as compared to having just one antenna here that is omnidirectional transmitting, so equally strong in all directions. This is actually a elementary form of multiple antenna communication where you within this panel have multiple antenna elements, but you're feeding them with sort of the same signals. At least there is a fixed relationship between them, which means that the beam towards these lucky users here is always the same one. And these users are benefiting from a 16 dB stronger signal or 40 times stronger signal, but unlucky users that are not within the main beam area here, but are still in the area where this antenna is supposed to give service, they will not benefit from this antenna gain at all. They might even have a lower signal quality as compared to having an omnidirectional antenna here. So in order to deal with that, we would like to have adaptive beamforming, which is what multiple antenna communication is about. So we can steer this beam towards 
for example, the signal bouncing on this object so that we are reaching these unlucky users. And wherever the users are in the coverage area, we would like to be able to steer the beams towards the locations where the users are. And there has been a large evolution of this type of antenna technology, which is sometimes called active antennas because they are not fixed, they are active. We can change the behaviors. So if we go from this traditional one antenna system, which is also known as a sector antenna, Within this box here, you might have eight radiating elements, but they are fed by the same signal. So that's why we have one input here. And that is why you're getting a fixed beamforming. And if every element here have seven dBi, and so they are like a patch antenna that is focusing the signal forward with seven dB stronger signal uh, right in front of the antenna, then it would be with an omnidirectional antenna. Then in total, this sums up to 16 dBi because these eight antennas here are representing a nine dB beamforming gain. Together with seven, that becomes 16. So the evolution have then been that in 4G, we were having this type of eight antenna arrays instead. And what they are containing is that we take this type of sector antennas, now we put four of them next to each other each row here is containing one, two, three, four different radiating element locations, but each one of them actually contains two antennas. This is what these crosses are indicating. So these are antennas radiating the signals in different so-called polarized directions. And then we have then eight elements on one row and we have eight different rows. So there are 64 elements in total, whereof 32 are for one polarization and 32 are for the other polarization. But then at the back side here, we only have eight transceiver chains that is going in. So every column is operated in the same way as before here, except that we can actually also control the two different polarizations. So two antennas in each of these different columns, eight antennas in total. And what this gives us the possibility to do is to send different beams in different directions horizontally, because all of the antenna elements that are on top of each other are actually steered in a fixed manner, but we have in the horizontal domain here the possibility of doing adaptive beam forming. So we can send up to eight horizontal beams pointing in entirely different directions. So that is how narrow the different beams are. Then it, we might not want to use all of them at the same time. That is sort of the idea with massive MIMO that you should have more antennas than you have users to avoid interference, but this is what we are capable of doing. And then in the brand new type of base station antennas that you can find, we have 64 antennas. So it's sort of taking the same type of aperture as here, but we might rotate it to focus even more on the horizontal directions because users are typically separated horizontally and not in different elevation directions. And then we take each of these antenna elements and we connect it to a transceiver chain. So in this case, we have something of the same size, but we can control every single element, which gives us not a larger beamforming gain on the maximum, but a larger flexibility of steering the beams adaptively in every direction you like. So you can both steer beams horizontally and vertically. That's what is known as 3D beamforming. So what is important to notice here that there is a difference between transceiver chains, which is the same thing as antennas, and radiating elements. So typically you have more radiating elements than you have antennas. So here we have one antenna, but eight radiating elements. Here we have eight antennas, but 64 radiating elements. And massive MIMO is often about having roughly as many radiating elements than you have antennas or transceiver chains. So a antenna is the same thing as a transceiver chain connected to radiating elements. So you are able to control it. So this is a type of antennas that are being used now in 5G and the latest version of 4G. So here's an example of a Nokia 64 antenna base station that was shown in May 2018. So they were putting it up in New York City, for example, and it's actually size-wise not much larger than these other base station that is behind here. The important thing is now that it is wider, but not as tall as before. And you can see here that we have eight by eight radiant elements. Each of these ones have these crosses here, which is saying that this is a crossed polarized antenna. So you have actually 
128 trade and elements, but these are mapped together in such a way that we get 64 antennas in these type of base stations. And Nokia is not the only company that have this, Ericsson and Huawei and other companies also have this type of product. Sodium mass in my technology that we have been talking about in this course is something that is just being deployed around the world. And we cannot know what kind of processing that is going into this one, but I would guess that it is the type of maximum ratio processing that I've been talking about in the previous lectures. And then there are more advanced algorithms for doing the pre-coding and receiver filtering, such as this MMSE method that I've been talking about previously in the course. I believe that they are not being used so far, and this is illustrating one of the main trends when it comes to building base stations, that the hardware is very capable already, but we will be able to evolve the software all the time to add more advanced algorithms along the way. So a lot of the development in terms of base station will be in the software in the future. So what are then the different aspects of multiple antenna communication that I've been covering in this course? Well, I've been talking about first the point-to-point -point scenarios, the SIMA channel, the MISO channel, the MIMA channel. So the point-to-point -point MIMA channel. And then we moved on to the multi-user scenario where we have an M antenna base station, for example, 64 antennas as in this massive MIMO base station I was just describing. And we're using them to serve K single antenna terminals. And then I've also been talking about channel modeling when it comes to multiple antennas, both the deterministic cases where we have line of sight and the random type of channels, uh, such as IID Rayleigh fading. And in those different cases, we can either talk about the conventional type of capacity for deterministic channels, or for random channels, we can talk about outage capacity or egotic capacity, depending on how quickly the channels are evolving. When it comes to the point-to-point -point scenarios, what we are after is to improve the performance for a particular user in the system. So say that we have a network with four different base stations here, and then the user is located somewhere. And depending on where the user is, the spectral efficiency in bit per second per hertz that we can deliver to this user will depend on the channel conditions and also on the technology. So if you are close to the base station, you might be able to get the highest performance that the system is uh, being able to deliver, which in this case is assumed to be 8 bits per second per hertz. And then as you move away from the base station, you get the weaker and weaker signals. And in many of the location, the systems, we are down here at the blue values where you are far from the maximum performance that you can deliver. But with MIMO technology, what we can achieve is the beamforming gain that increases the received signal power everywhere which means that the area around its base station where you can get the largest possible data rate, the largest spectral efficiency, is going to be much larger. And then also all around it here, we are able to improve the performance by delivering a beamforming gain, not only in the center of the cells as with fixed beamforming, but also at the edges where you are sort of the unlucky users. So everyone is benefiting, but particularly the users at the edges of the cell will benefit from getting a beamforming gain that they were not able to get in a traditional network. So there are two different main benefits here. There's the beamforming gain, which is illustrated in this here, going from this case to a case with a large beamforming gain, where everyone gets better performance. And then we have the multiplexing gain as well, where you, if you have multiple antennas, both at the transmitter and at the receiver, can send multiple data streams at the same time, and not only get 8 bits per second per hertz, but a multiple of that that is proportional to the number of antennas to have both at the transmitter and at the receiver. So in summary, when it comes to point-to-point -point MIMO, the advantages of it is the multiplexing gain and the beamforming gain, which is jointly helping us to increase the capacity for a single user. So whenever you would like to say that our network can have a peak data rate of a particular number, well, that is based on that you are using the ideal type of point-to-point -point MIMO. The largest multiplexing gain that you are supporting in the network the largest modulation format, and then you are assigning all of your bandwidth to a single user. And a other advantage is that you only need to have channel state information at the receiver side. So the transmitter don't need to know the channel, it can spread out the signal in different directions, and then the receiver will process the received signal in order to still be able to decode all of the different data streams. The disadvantage of point-to-point -point MIMO is that 
you are getting the scaling in terms of multiplexing gain by increasing both the transmitter and the receiver's number of antennas, but it might be hard to fit many antennas into a user terminal, in particular on the traditional frequencies that are used for wireless communications. Below 5 GHz you might only be able to fit two antennas, one with each polarization. When we are now building 5G devices that are also being able to operate at the millimeter wave frequencies, at those frequencies a antenna becomes much smaller. But you then want to have many antennas in your terminal instead so that the total area of antennas becomes roughly the same because that is what determines how much energy you can capture. And then you have the possibility of running point-to-point -point MIMO and at least you will get beamforming gains. The problem with get running point-to-point -point MIMO in those cases is that it might be that the channel matrix G have only a few singular values at the large, or if you compute this uh, outer product between G and itself, then you, it might only have a few large eigenvalues. And that was sort of one of the issues with point-to-point -point MIME as well, that when you have high SNR so that you are able to send many data streams, then you might have a channel matrix that is sort of sparse, so you are not having so many strong directions, only a few. When it comes to multi-user MIMO or massive MIMO, the main benefit now is instead that we have spatial multiplex of different users. So traditionally, you might have a base station with two different sectors here, or often three sectors, but the main point is that you have fixed beams pointing towards the coverage area. They are broad so that they will cover the entire area without even knowing where the user is because they are fixed beams. And in this case, you only have two then users that you can serve. But with a massive number of antennas, each of them being much smaller than these panels because you are sort of taking each of the radiating elements in the panel and you turn it into antenna. Then you are able to send much more narrow beams towards users in different directions in an adaptive manner and in that way you can serve many users at the same time. They get a beamforming gain, each of them, and we also have this multiplexing gain. So the main benefits of multi-user MIMO is to serve many users at the same time frequency resource and protect against the interference also with these narrow beams. So in summary, for multi-user MIMO, the advantages is that we still get the multiplexing gain and the beamforming gain, which increases the sum capacity of our system. So if we would like to then improve the network throughput and improve then the spectral efficiency, that is what multi-user MIMO is doing. It's a very scalable technology in the sense that we can have any number of antennas at the base stations and we can at least serve tens of users and it's also only the base station that really needs to know the channel state information because that is the one who is going to control all of its antennas and steer beams in different directions in the ways that we have been describing. Estimating the channels from uplink pilots and then transmit back in a downlink or process received signals. The disadvantage is that the capacity per user doesn't grow as fast as the sum capacity in this type of systems. Every user is benefiting from a beamform gain, but that is a logarithmic gain with number of antennas. And in the downlink, you also then need to share your power between the users. So you cannot expect that the capacity per user will grow that fast. But since you're able to serve multiple users, you still have this benefit that the sum capacity is growing. And if you already have many users and you previously need to divide the spectrum between them, well, now you can serve all the users at the same time. Everyone can get the full spectrum and then you still benefit in terms of the capacity per user. But a disadvantage is that we require many active users to really see these type of gains. So if you have a cell with massive MIMO and you only have one user in it, well then you won't see any fantastic gains. So that means that we won't see massive MIMO being deployed everywhere immediately, but operators will select cells where they have a lack of capacity, where you have more traffic than you can handle in a good way with your existing technology, and then they will put up a 5G base station there with massive MIMO technology. And we also have talked a lot about that we must implement massive MIMO in the right way, particularly using this TDD reciprocity when you send the uplink pilot to estimate the channels and transmit back using those estimates. Otherwise, you won't be able to see all of these gains as we have been describing in the course. And unfortunately, many of the frequency bands that have been used for cellular communication for a long time are not TDD bands, but FDD bands. And in those cases, it's not as easy 
to just take the base station and replace it with the Master Mario base station because it won't provide you with all of these great gains that I've been describing in this course. However, many of the new frequency bands that are being licensed for 5G are 2D bands. So there's definitely a trend towards using more and more 2D bands because we know that those are the cases where you can actually do multi-user MIMO in its ideal way. We also talked about fading channels. We have slow fading channels where we get one random realization throughout our transmission and we need to select how to transmit before we know what kind of realization of the channel we're having. So that's why we talked about the outage probability, the probability that we happen to transmit with the data rate that this channel can support, and the outage capacity which is a way of selecting the data rate that we transmit with to fit the particular outage probability. And then we have been talking about the fast fading cases where we talked about ergodic capacity and coherence interval. So this is the case where the channels are fixed for a particular time and frequency interval known as a coherence interval and then it varies between them and during our transmission we will see a very large number of different random realizations. And for both categories of fading channels we benefit from having multiple antennas. In particular we can achieve diversity gains. So say that we have a Rayleigh fading channel and here is the channel gain, the squared normal absolute value squared of the channel. Then here it's shown in a logarithmic scale and here we have different random realizations independent of each other. And you can see that when you have one antenna we have these huge variations of the Rayleigh fadings and that is sort of the problem that if we would like to guarantee that we are transmitting at the rate where the channel gain is always satisfying that one, well then we need to expect that the channel gain should be very small here because we have these large variations from the largest to the smallest realizations. While if we have say 100 antennas, we are moving up to getting a bigger channel gain. We have 100 times better channel gain on the average when we have 100 antennas compared to one, but we also see smaller variations around this mean value and that is what is very helpful both in the slow fading case because it enables us to say that well we can select a rate here that is still fairly large and that one will require the channel gain the squared norm on the channel vector to be above this number here and it happens all the time so we will get much better capacity and reliability compared to having just one antenna and in the fast fading case we also have the benefit that the channels are not varying very quickly. We need to apply a new pre-coding vector or a new receiver filter in every coherence interval, but after we have applied that one, we see a effective channel gain that is almost the same all the time. So that's why we have a large amount of reliability in the system and we don't need to send pilots in the downlink to estimate the channels because the users can expect that well the channels are going to be approximately this number here all the time. So what have we not covered in this course? There is a wide range of things. I've been selecting to cover the fundamentals both in the point-to-point -point MIMO cases, the fading channels and in the multi-user MIMO or massive MIMO cases. Just to give you some flavors of things that are important but we haven't studied when it comes to point-to-point -point MIMO, cases with imperfect channel knowledge at the receiver or at transmitter is something that we haven't covered. Well, when it comes to transmitter, we cover the case when we don't know the channel at all, but what if we know it partially? What can we do in those cases? And for the receiver, we always assume that the receiver knows the channel perfectly. But if it doesn't know it perfectly, but only have estimates similar to what we were considering in the massive MIMO cases, well, what do we do? This is something that we haven't covered in this course. And when it comes to massive MIMO, I've been focusing to a large extent on maximum ratio processing, which is the simplest method. It's something that is probably used today in massive MIMO base stations, but we can do better than that. There are methods such as zero forcing uh, that is mentioned in the Fundamentals of Massive MIMO book, and I've also been touching upon the MMSC receivers. That was something I talked about when it comes to channels with perfect channel knowledge, but we can apply them also in other cases. And also, we have been focusing only on independent Rayleigh fading channels. Realistic channels are not perfectly independent, particularly as you add more and more antennas into the system, you have more and more so-called spatial correlation, where the signals are going to be mainly coming from certain directions and less from other directions. And that can be modeled as well. There is something known as correlated Rayleigh fading that one can study, for example.
but we didn't include in this course because we can more easily understand the fundamental behaviors of massive MIMO by studying the independent Rayleigh fading case where we get this uh, convenient closed form expression that are describing how the capacity lower bounds are behaving. But for example, if you want to understand how pilot contamination behaves in a more general fashion, well then it's very important to also know about correlated Rayleigh fading. And when it comes to fading channels, we were using this simplified model of reality that we call block fading with the coherence intervals. We have a fixed channel within one coherence interval and then you have another random realization in the next one and another in the next one. But in reality, we have more gradual variations of the channel, both within a coherence interval but also between coherence intervals. So it won't be totally independent between different coherence intervals, but there are possibility of tracking the channels or predicting how it will look like in the future. So these are possibilities in order to exploit the fine details of fading channels in a much more advanced way than we have talked about in this course. What will happen in the future? Well, massive MIMO in this type of 64 antenna cases is being used already, and we have been using point-to-point -point MIMO cases for a long time. When it comes to research into future technologies, something that is being developed is so-called distributed massive MIMO or cell-free massive MIMO. In these systems, we take the antennas that would traditionally be in the box on the base station tower in the center of the cell, and we spread them out over the coverage area instead. When a user somewhere in this coverage area is transmitting his uplink signal, a large number of antennas are gonna listen to it. And then we will use those signals as a MIMO receiver that is distributed in order to uh, process it and extract information. And similarly, in the downlink, multiple distributed antennas are gonna transmit to the user. And to build something like this, we need to evolve the basic theory that I covered in this course to handle a case where you have distributed antennas, where you're processing and the observation are different places. You need to coordinate all these antennas and you need to model the channels in different ways. There's many different new aspects to this type of systems, but it can be utilized in order to create a more uniform performance for the users in the systems because the chance that you will be close to at least some of the antennas becomes much larger than when you have all the antennas in just one place when you can be both far away and close to it. In the distributed massive MIMA system you have a bigger chance of being close to at least some of the antennas. Another topic that people are doing research into now is called intelligent reflecting surfaces where instead of having a big massive MIMA array, you have a smaller antenna that you're focusing towards a intelligent reflecting surface, which is like a MIMA array, it's just that it doesn't create the signals itself. It contains many small elements that is taking the signal at reaching them, and then they are phase shifting them or time delaying them in such a way that we can create the beams towards users. This resembles the type of ideas that we have in satellite receivers where you have a fixed parabolic surface that is taking the signals coming from the satellite and then is reflecting it towards a receive antenna. And in this case, we are making this in a much more flexible manner because we have a surface that is reconfigurable. So depending on where the user is, the signal coming from this transmitter can be reflected as a beam in different directions. And that makes it intelligent. A third new deployment concept is extremely large aperture arrays. So if these 64 antenna massive MIMO antennas that I've been talking about are still something that you can put on the top of a building and be quite small and compact, and they can be used to send a signal as a beam towards user. What we can instead do is to spread out the antennas over the entire facade of a building. And in this way, the aperture, namely the total length of the array will be much larger. And when the distance from the array to the user is on the same order as the length of the array, well in those cases we are not creating beams like this. Instead we are focusing the signals in a sort of ball around where the user is. And this is called the geometric near field. And in this type of ways, we can focus the signals in much, much smaller areas in space. And this way we can serve many more users. And we can, for example, go from having say 64 antennas to have thousands of antennas uh, and spread them out over a much larger area. So that's the end of lecture 12 and multiple antenna communications and also the end of this lecture series.